Praise the Lord. I'm grateful to God and privileged and humbled to be invited today and uh, be visiting this place. Thank you for allowing me to share your day and uh, share with you what God has put on my heart. I want to thank Barry and Batia, Alistair, and all the friends who've worked hard to plan for this. Excited to be with you. And I believe God has prepared a message for us. Today, uh, my name is Nizar, as you could see it on, on the screen, and uh, I was born in Nazareth 54 years ago tomorrow. Yeah? <laughs> so our God is good, excited to serve him and be his servant. Hallelujah. I'm married to Katie. Uh, maybe the picture is a little bit uh, they couldn't see it, but um, we have three children. Our oldest is 27. His name is Sam, and he's uh, married. He has also two beautiful babies, two twin girls. That was our first greater surprise uh, because we knew, we knew she was pregnant, but we didn't know she was really pregnant. So <laughs> for us, it was a great surprise. So our God is good, and we have Sarah, our daughter, and she's uh, 25. She's engaged, uh, praying that uh, next June she will be married. And then we have Jonathan, who's 21. Uh, he just finished his first year in uh, the Technion in Haifa, and we are hoping for the better for him in the future. So uh, living in Nazareth, um, the first years of my life, like when I was 19, just after high school, I was looking for something. There was this void in my heart. I was searching for something. I didn't know what it was. I had this hunger, you know, this thirst in my heart. I couldn't understand even where I was going yet. So I had this job at the gasoline station just after school to start, you know, making some money to start saving for going to college. All of that is, is important. As a young man just turned 18 and I, the life is just open ahead of you. So I was at this gas station, and one day, this uh, blue car drives in. Uh, there was an American man in it. So he pulls in. He wants me to help him take some gasoline. I give him some gasoline, and he says, thank you, and then he leaves. A few days later, he comes again, so he starts becoming like a customer at this place. So I start seeing, seeing him every other day almost. So one day, I said, what do you do? What is your job? He said, well, I'm a pastor. I said, what's a pastor? <laughs> He said, I, I, you know, I have a church, and I preach, and I teach in the church. Oh, that's nice. We got this talk. Make the story short. Why don't you come and visit us? I said, where's your church? He said, it's just around the corner. It was two minutes walk from the gasoline station, but I didn't know there was a church even there. I didn't. So one day after work, I went to this church. And the moment I walked in, it seems like, I don't know if you have had this experience, the Lord captured my heart. He just took over immediately. I didn't know what I was doing there. I was worshiping. I was praying with the people. I was lifting up my hands. I didn't know. Yet, I wasn't a believer. I, I was just doing what they were doing. I know you were doing that too, but don't cheat, okay? <laughs> we all were there with those moments, but real believers, and honestly speaking, it's about a decision that we make. It's not about just getting involved with some believers. We have to choose and Take Jesus to be the king of our lives and to really crown him and serve him and worship him. To know that, that experience, what does that make, mean in your life? So I started going to that church. First six months, I became a believer. But in, in secret, I went, I went home and confessed my life to Jesus because I was a very shy person. The first rows were not mine. I was always in the back rows because I, was all, I didn't want people to see me coming you know, and, and kneeling down and praying. I was very shy, but still I needed to break that barrier. And I was in my room through the night in my dark room. We're we are talking about getting from darkness to light. In my dark room, I was praying and I was weeping. I was just crying and seeking God to forgive me of my sins. Something, you know, I was trying to think what were my sins, really. I mean, I was, but I was still confessing and God was bringing back all those memories as a young man, you know. I was still young, you know. But all that short past that I was already getting dirty and ugly in my life. But he just got me at the right time. And he directed 
my path to a different way. Hallelujah. So I opened my eyes in the morning and I opened my window. I looked out there and this beautiful light. I saw everything new. I go to work. All of my friends would come up to me and say, Nizar, what's wrong with you today? I would say, what do you mean what's wrong with me today? <laughs> they, and they said, you, your countenance are different. Now, I want you to listen to this. I, honestly, they said that so much that I went to the mirror. <laughs> I looked at the mirror. I, want, I wanted to say, like, what do you see that I don't? I feel something. I feel this presence of God. I feel this fire in my heart. Then it, that was the moment when I started sharing my story with my friends. And that's when God started touching people's hearts, when I was sharing what, was, what God was doing in my life. And gradually started just giving up this world and following the Lord and saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? What's next? I'm happy to be a believer. But he was putting this, some type of a heaviness on my heart to go and seek the lost and go tell people about me. At the age of 19, that was just the first year, I was baptized in water, and that was a highlight in my life. It took me a little bit, I would say, deeper with the Lord. Uh, two years later, I, I went already to Bible college. Four years later, I graduated. The fifth year, I was in Jerusalem. I was living here for 10 years in Jerusalem. God called me down here. I found my wife. The first year, we got married and we lived together here. We had our children, beautiful city, but very dark city. Beautiful place to do ministry, a lot of ministry. You can work 24-7 and you cannot be done. You can just work every day, all night, visiting with people. The city needs the light of the Lord. Even today, I've been out of Jerusalem for 20 years now. But living in Jerusalem, I always had this burden for the city. You know, the peace of Jerusalem. You know how it is. It's, it's that feeling that you would love to see the city in peace, in full peace. But there was this dark cloud over the city. And I always felt this was a religion. You know, and religion have made God look so ugly. And people today, they reject God and they deny him. Because of the acts of those religious people who think they have God, but unfortunately, they follow a certain set of rules in their lives. But there is no light, a real light in their lives. In the year 2000, God put on my heart to go back to Nazareth. And I don't know when you like change places after 10 years, that is not the easiest thing to do. We were established our kids in schools, everything was going good. The church was growing in Jerusalem. And then God put this call on my heart to leave and go back to Nazareth. And I tell you guys, I don't know if you argue with God, but I argued with God. Because <laughs> I said, listen, Jesus, let's have a talk. I said, Lord, you lived in this city most of your life. And when you came and you declared that you were the Messiah in that synagogue... They took you out of that synagogue and they wanted to, to throw you off that cliff. And you're going to send me there? And you said nothing. Will anything, I mean, Nathaniel said, will anything good come out of Nazareth? I said, Lord, remember this. And, but you yourself said, no prophet without honor, but in his own hometown. So I don't want to go back. If you want me back, you have to talk to me. You have to put this heavy in my heart. That place, Nazareth, is the city of unbelief. People just don't believe. I think they take it for granted that they live in Nazareth. One day some friends in, in Bethlehem said, our house is attached to the, to the church of nativity in, in Bethlehem. So I said, how does that help you? <laughs> I said, if your back is attached to the back of Jesus Christ himself, you will not be saved. You have to face him face to face. You have to receive him in your life and change your heart. Choose to follow him and be light for him. Hallelujah. We took over the, the church in Nazareth. We had about 15 people in that congregation. Many pastors came through. Through the 10 years I was away, Probably five or six pastors 
were trying to do some kind of work, but it just didn't work for some reason. I think people get used to a pastor who stays there. If you leave after two years or even less than that, you know, people scatter. Again, they just leave. And they want to get used to a new pastor who comes in. So it's always a challenge to change leaders in the church. But when I came in, I said, God, if you have called me here, I'm not going to leave until you tell me to leave. And this church has a future. I can see it. We started fasting and praying and seeking God for Nazareth. And then the first two years were very difficult, you know, very challenging. We didn't even move an inch, you know, in, in, in the church as far as growth. But the third year, we took again the eight-day fast from Sunday to Sunday. Then there was a breakthrough in that meeting. We had a lady in the church who was very ill. And when we laid hands on her, anointed her with oil, she was healed. And God was telling us, this is the moment I'm going to set you free. This is the moment I'm going to use this church to have an effect on the city. Hallelujah. Today we have a beautiful church. And we, uh, because of one of the problems we have, which is a good problem, we have a, a smaller space. Now we, we started building a bigger space. We praise God. We are, we are almost finished with that new space that will sit over 200 people. For us, it's a great achievement because we, we were in the small place like 150. Now we had added about 50 or more extra places. We know it's not about the number, but it's about the impact of the presence of Jesus in that place. We worship God in that place in freedom. It's just a beautiful church to visit and to enjoy the music and the worship for God. When I thought about the title of the conference here, the first thing that came to my mind is me coming out of darkness to light. Me to have the first experience in my life following Jesus, who is the Lord that have given light. He is light. And, you know, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But what challenges me more is when he said, you are the light of the world. What a responsibility Friends, what a responsibility. Jesus has sent us to this world that is so dark to be light and to be salt. That means to be effective. You know, and we have no light in us. We lived in darkness for so long. But we are the light. We, are, we didn't receive light. We have become the light. And now, it's not my words, right? Let's look at... Um, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Hallelujah. Um, I'm still not used to this, these machines. I always use my Bible. But recently started. I'm in first and in second. So it's verses four to, um, I'm sorry, chapter four, verse six. I'm sorry. I hope I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> For God who said, let light, let light shine out of darkness made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. So he gave us this light that reflects glory. And I want to give a picture here of, remember when um, Moses was in the desert and he was on Mount Sinai and he received first the Ten Commandments written. He came down from the mountain and then because he saw what the people were worshiping after him being away for 40 days, he got mad. So he broke those stones at a moment of anger. So God sent him back again up there and he gave him new stones. Now, when he came down from the mountain the next time, the second time, his face was shining with light. Now, I want you to just think about this. 
Moses is coming down and all of his friends are looking at him. And there is this glow. What do people see when they look at you? You see, it's an attitude. Light is not like a light like this, what you see in, in, you know, in light bulbs. It's, it's this shining presence of God. It's this glory that God has given you that is reflected through the presence of Jesus in you. So the light is not in us. The light is us. We are the light of this world. So when people look at us, they need to see Jesus. They don't need to see our personality, our character. They look at us and they will see Jesus. I have experienced so many people moving between religions. I want to also put this in front of you. Just take it as a matter of prayer, please. Um, you hear Muslims coming out of Islam and receiving Jesus as their savior. For us as believers, we call that coming out from darkness to light. If a Christian... A traditional Christian, a nominal Christian, I would say that very carefully, leaves Christianity as his religion and goes to Islam. Muslims call it, this Christian have come out of darkness to light. Now listen to me carefully. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Being a Christian is a challenge. God sends you out there to set an example. People will watch you and look at you. And I think we have that light and we are able to impact our neighbors and our friends. Our lifestyle is, is important, you know how we live. Our reaction when we are angry. What do people see? Is it our old nature, our old man, our old language, the bad tongue that we use? So people moving from religion to another religion, for me, it's not a change. It's going from a dark place to a dark place. Again, it's a religion because you're choosing another religion. You're moving between religions, but that doesn't save you. And what breaks my heart is those people who are missing the experience to have Jesus as their Lord and King. And they still call themselves Christians. They call themselves Christians because they go to church. Because they were a crucifix. Because they memorized the Lord's Prayer. Because they light a candle somewhere. Because they have the statue of Mary in their home. That's what I face every day. Where I have seen people kneeling in front of that statue, weeping and crying for Mary to help them. I would cry with them sadly because they don't have the experience of Jesus. They never were connected to him. They were never taught how to pray and seek his face, seek his presence. And they want a breakthrough in their life. That's not going to happen. But through the one who can make it happen, only the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Most of our people in our church are from either a Catholic background or uh, an Orthodox background, and some from a Muslim background. Now, they've seen the light in this church, and that's why they came. And they keep telling us there is something different in this place. God has given us this, this um, characteristic in the church that when people walk in, God somehow touches them. <laughs> and they will want to come back. And they all mostly would give us their phone number because, because they want a visit. They want to talk more about how can you worship like this? How can you sing so freely? How can you clap your hands? They used to laugh at us because we clap. People clap in the church, shame on you. It's like you're doing something wrong. People dance in the church. Oh my goodness. Dance. Go read your Bible. <laughs> Go read Psalms, at least the last Psalm, you know, go and, and learn how to rejoice. But you see, you cannot rejoice if you don't have that presence. You cannot, you just, if Jesus is king of your life, is the king of your life, you will dance, you will shout, you'll go out there, let everyone know that he is your king and he is to be lifted and to be glorified. Hallelujah. Amen. So, um, 
Can we read another passage? Um, let's look at John 3, 18. He starts by saying, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Okay, what's the verdict? Light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of light. Because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light. Hmm. And will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. So that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Hallelujah. In Arabic, the translation is a little bit weaker. Here it says they kind of preferred, right? Um, people have loved darkness more than light. People have loved. Can you imagine? Can someone love darkness? We have been in dark places. I have been in dark places. I have been in places where, where the enemy was prevailing. I, I visited some homes, some of them Muslim, some of them Catholic, where people were bound by evil spirits. And as soon as you step in, you feel this darkness. Immediately. It just shows, it's, it's a reflection of what's in their hearts. Like, I can see the reflection in, in your life when I look at you. And I can't tell if it's the light of the Lord or if it's something else. That is called spirit of discernment. So you walk in and you have that feeling. God gives you that feeling. You know. What would you do if you would walk into a house that's full of demons? Now someone has to be trembling. Right? Either the one that's coming in or the one that is already in. So I walk in and I know I am a threat. Guys, listen, you are a threat. Because of the presence of Jesus in you, it's not because of your personality. God has anointed you with such power that wherever you go, your light will shine. We receive our light. It's like, you know, you know the, the moon is like a, a dark planet, right? Where does it get its light? The sun. So it's a reflection, actually, of the sun. So what about us? We have the reflection of the light of Jesus in our lives. Hallelujah. So it's not in us. It's not in us. It's we became the light because of the presence of Jesus. Wherever you go, let your light shine. As a, as a, a teenager, you know, I was teaching Sunday school. You know, you've, some of you maybe still do. I mean, Sunday school, back in the church, we talk about kids. I don't know how it is here. Because <laughs> Sunday school in America can, can mean everybody. But for us, Sunday school means children. So I used to teach the children, you know, the song, Give me oil in my lamp and keep me burning. <laughs> I'm asking for that oil even today. Because the enemy wants to put off this fire. Your enthusiasm for ministry. Your love for Christ. He wants to draw you. He wants to take you back to the dark places. I thank God that we live now in the light. We are not anymore in dark places. Hallelujah. God has drawn you out. God has taken you out of those places. You will not go back. You need to actually fight. Fight for your life. Fight against sin. Fight. I, I was in the States about um, almost uh, 10 days ago. And I was preaching and God gave me from the beginning of this year, to teach about something funny. Now listen to this. God sometimes is funny, right? Yeah. Sometimes I laugh when he says things. He's very funny. Like 
going to Nazareth, you know, was a very funny thing. But. So, I was teaching about something called jihad. Jihad. You know jihad? Have you heard jihad? Jihad, jihad is a holy war in, in the Arabic language. But I was preaching and teaching about holy Christian jihad. And I was teaching about three levels of jihad that we face daily. Now, when I say holy war or holy fight, I'm talking about like Hebrews talks about fighting against sin. Because he says that you have not fought yet to the shedding of blood against sin. When he used that word fight, he used the word jihad. In Arabic, it's translated as jihad. Jihad means like, let me give the examples and then I'll tell you what it means. Jesus in the garden was praying just before the cross in, in Luke chapter 22. He was on his knees. He was, the Bible says he was in jihad, praying. I don't know, I don't know, I'm asking you, asking myself, when was it last time you've been in jihad in prayer? You felt like you're sweating so hard because there is something burning in your heart. There is a challenge there that you feel if you don't do that, nothing is going to change. Jesus was facing death. And if you are striving, if you are fighting, if you are in jihad, in prayer, God will send an angel to stand before you and encourage you. That's what he did when Jesus was praying. An angel from heaven came down, was encouraging him. How many here need encouragement? We all need encouragement, guys. So we fight and strive in prayer. We fight and strive in, um, what did I say? In, in, uh, it's against sin, thank you. And the third one is strife in evangelism. Uh, Paul in the second letter of Timothy, Timothy said that he fought the good fight. Yeah, and he uses the same word there in Arabic, jihad jihad al hasan. I fought the good fight. So what was he fighting for? He was fighting for you and me. He wanted to deliver the message that was burning in his heart. He went everywhere. He didn't let anything stop him. That means jihad. When you don't let anything stop you, that is jihad. Maybe the word in, in the world out there in the Islamic world was perverted. It was used in different directions. Jihad means killing people for different reasons and purposes. But our jihad is a holy, real holy warfare. Because our real fight is against the enemy. That is taking over cities and villages in Israel and around the world. Our role is to keep witnessing and to keep declaring Jesus as the Savior. And he is the only hope for Israel. He is the only hope for the Arabs, Palestinians, all over the world. He is the only hope for this world. He is. You cannot change that. I cannot change that. This is the person of Jesus. He is the hope of this world. Now whatever you are hoping for, he is your hope. He will give you a breakthrough if you trust him. Hallelujah. I praise him for choosing me to be a servant. And what brings me, nothing brings me more pleasure in my life than the time I see people turning to Jesus. Especially if they are not traditional Christians. Because Christians might be more accepting, more open, because they know at least a little bit about Christian faith, they are easy probably in a sense, they are easy to win, but they are the most difficult to maintain. You know, to maintain believers is a, is a job by itself. To keep encouraging believers, you know, and, and lifting up believers and carrying believers, that's quite a job. We need to start taking down that load and leave it on Jesus and take another load in its place. Now carry in our hearts the people of this land, the sinners of your land, of your neighborhood, of your city, of your country. Now take them in your heart in prayer so you can start striving and being in jihad for the sinners. Enough is enough. Yeah. Woo.
Good preaching, Pastor Nizar. Good preaching. I know <laughs> maybe you would say in your mind, oh, he, he must be suffering <laughs> with his congregation. You know, they are tough people. They are hard to take care of. They are. They are. The disciples were not the best. They caused Jesus so much pain. I'm not a better servant than my, than my master. Neither you. <laughs> right? I'm not a better messenger. All this, the disciples went through hardships and they suffered. But they still were able to declare the light of Jesus. Today, our church, not our church, the church is rich materially but very poor spiritually. And many churches have decided there are no results, so let's as well, you know, let's give it up and let's go do something different. I've seen so many closed churches. I've seen so many pastors who left the ministry because of that pain I was talking about earlier. But we need today to lift up our eyes and keep them on our Savior. He is the initiator of our faith. That's where we get help from, from keeping our eyes focused on Jesus. Guys, this is not going to change. He sent us the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. He sent him to stay with us. And now he dwells in us. He is in us. He's around us. He moves before us everywhere we go. He prepares the place that he sends you to do ministry. He talks to people's hearts. He pierces people's hearts. He convicts hearts. This is the Holy Spirit. And you go there, and sometimes when it's easy, and people are so open and they receive Jesus immediately, you're happy. But it's not always easy. It's not always people just simply receiving Jesus. People can just ask you to leave. People can just slam the door, say, get out of here. We don't need to hear about Jesus. When I first came to believe at home, they kind of, you know, became worried <laughs> about me. My mom said, we are Christians too. What's the difference? Why do you keep talking about Jesus only all the time? It's like, you're like the Chinese people, you eat rice every day. <laughs> My friends, I love rice, no problem. <laughs> yeah? I said, mom, what do you want me to do? I, I just can't help it. This is my, now this is my new nature. I have experienced this light and I want people to see it. Why, why don't you like it? She, it's not that. I think I, you're, you're losing your mind. You, need, you know, there are other things in the world to do. She, you know, she said, yeah, I, I love Jesus. You know, I, I like Jesus, but you know, but you're a young man. You need to go and celebrate your life and enjoy life. Man, come on. You can leave Jesus later, you know. And while she was saying that, she was thinking, okay, one day you'll be religious, but not now. You're a young man. Come on. She's my mom. <laughs> I said, mom, I need you to help me in this, not, not stand in my way. I just feel like I should be doing this. Now, I come from a tradition called Greek Orthodox tradition. Okay? When I first believed and they saw that I was kind of had, had this heart for ministry, they, f they were the first group to approach me. They kind of, I think they saw potential maybe. They were looking for priests and they approached me and said, would you be a priest with us? And I said, will you give me the freedom to preach and teach the gospel? Will you let me be dressed like this? Just those simple questions. And of course, they, they never came back to me. I'm glad, praise God, you know, because I don't want to be religious. <laughs> I cannot see myself dressed, you know, in black, like men in black, you know, <laughs> all black, with the hat, black hat. I'm not, listen, I don't want to, like, sound uh, sarcastic because of this. These people are great, wonderful people, but they are lost in my eyes. The way I see things, they are lost because people who follow tradition are lost 
Only people who follow Jesus are found. You can't expect me after experiencing Jesus to go kiss some icons or start some, you know, use some incense in your prayers and, and repeat your prayers. I cannot repeat one prayer. Only maybe the Lord's Prayer. I, can, I have it by heart. But if I want to pray, I, cannot, I, don't, I, cannot, I have no control. I have no control of my prayers. I, I start praying. Nothing can stop me. I don't know. I don't know about you. I, I cannot stop. Well, time might stop me if I just go free. But I've learned that coming out from darkness to light have just lit this fire in my heart. And when you enter the presence of the Lord to pray, you know, in Romans 5, Paul talks about those groanings. When you cannot express yourself, it's like when you come to a point where you just have no more words to say. Now, until the year 2000, when I moved from Jerusalem to Nazareth, until 2003, our congregation never experienced baptism of the Holy Spirit. Our church don't promote it, the, the denomination I work with. We never teach it. We never challenge people with that. But... <laughs> but it came. When we didn't expect it, it came. We couldn't resist it. We couldn't stop it. We couldn't challenge it. <laughs> we were just open. Okay, so we said, Lord, whatever you want to do, this is your people and this is your church. And immediately you see tens of people being baptized with the Holy Spirit and the, the heavens are open. And there is this new power that have been given to our church to stand and to fight back and to praise and to worship in freedom. For me, the only thing I live for now is the glory of Jesus. I want to glorify him amongst Muslims, amongst Arabs, Christians, Jews. We pray for this land because we believe this land has a special, special plan in God's heart. The peoples of this land, Arabs and Jews, there is a special plan in God's heart. Now listen, when I say special plan, I don't mean plan B. Please. Salvation has been completed. My hope and my prayers are for the Jewish people and the Palestinian people will turn from their wicked ways and come to the knowledge of Jesus, our Lord. Um, I'm always careful, you know, uh, I've learned something uh, funny, but it's, it's really uh, important. There is like a, a proverb or a, or a a saying in Germany that if someone is not knowing what he's talking about, or I, you, you correct me, you, you German friends, um, you say you are like, like walking, an elephant walking in crystal shop. Right? I feel many times like this because when I, when I speak, I, I don't like politics, and I'm not part of politics. I don't, I vote, okay, but I'll not tell you who for. Because I need to feel like I'm a citizen and I need to <laughs> take you know, my rights to, to execute them and then just go do it. But this land is in so much hatred and so much challenge that we need to reflect love and still continue to teach love for our people. Now the love of God that will fix things in this land when we take responsibility as locals, as a local pastor, when I take responsibility to, to pray for Prime Minister Netanyahu, when I take responsibility to pray for all those people who are in authority, I take responsibility, I don't just say it, I, take, I say, Lord, I challenge you to change those people's hearts. Don't we read in the Bible that, that the, the uh, hearts of the kings are like rivers in the hands of God? Okay, God directs them. So I, went, I look always at that and say, Lord, direct this man. And I don't think we understand how much pressure can be on a, on a leader's head. 
someone like a prime minister for this land especially. So we pray that God will give him strength to stand for the truth, for justice, for freedom. To be the prime minister of all people of this land. And also take, that's where my heart is like, um, I don't want to say divided, but it's, uh, it's in struggle. I pray for both peoples. I pray for Palestinian people, their leaders, their freedom. I pray for Jesus to start appearing to many of them, but for the church also to get up. And to be awake and go out there and start telling those Palestinian friends and brothers and sisters that they need Jesus. We need to keep that light shining. Now there are many powers that are coming to this land and they are trying to put off the fire of Christian faith. I will say two more things and I will wrap up. But... Um, we have the light. First thing is to stay on track. Okay? Because when you walk in the light, you cannot go astray. It's light. It's day. If you, work in, if you walk in darkness, many decisions or best decisions are made in, made in light. And this light is already within you. It's here. You have it. So bring your decisions to God. Bring your hopes, your dreams to God. Because in the light, things work. Now, when we are in our dark places, dark rooms, praying, that doesn't mean that there is darkness there. We are praying in the dark places, but we are praying one day these prayers will go out in the light. You will see the results. You see the fruit of those prayers coming across. The second thing is we have the light to have a fellowship. God said, if you love one another, we will have fellowship one with the other. If we walk in the light, right? Is that the, 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 the condition? First John talks about if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we will have fellowship with one another I think we can have fellowship if we have the person of Jesus in common between us we both believe that he is the only one that can give us joy um, I quoted uh, something from F by F.B. Meyer he said that the glory that was on Moses' face, the, that light that was, that was shining. He said this was the crowning of glory for change. Moses couldn't realize it. He didn't see it. But all those who saw Moses were able to see it. Every time Moses went to the tabernacle to pray, he had to cover his face. It was very strange to me. I, I, I couldn't, you know, understand. I thought when people came to see Moses, he had to, sh sh you know, uh, put the veil down. But the, when they first saw him, they didn't. But it seems that that light was so powerful. In the presence of God, actually what we should be doing is taking up the veil. Because we are exposed to the light. But living is, in the light is like this. It's the reflection of the presence of Jesus in our attitude, in our everyday life. When we talk to people, when we witness, when we go out there, I always tell my friends in the church, my people, tell people something that will touch them. Challenge them with a sentence. Just tell someone, God bless you. And in, in the Arabic culture where I serve, it's very acceptable. And it's very nice to say to someone, God bless you. But the language makes a difference. It's Arabic language. You know, in Arabic, our Bible uses the name God 
Allah. We Christians use Allah as to refer to the God of Israel, not the God of Islam. Okay? But this is how they translated the Arabic Bible in the 18th century. So they used that name. And that name was, after many studies, was actually found many, many years before Islam even existed. So they have already chosen that name that was already there. I'm saying this because if I want to say to an Arab that God bless you, in Arabic I say, Rabb ibarkak. The Lord bless you. Now I mean to say that because Lord in Arabic is, there is a reference like Rabb, like in Hebrew, Rav, Rabb. Okay? And in Islam, they use the word Rabb to refer to Allah. So I don't say, Allah bless you. I say, Rabb ibarkak. I mean, the Lord Jesus blesses you. Now you know how difficult it is to witness to uh, Muslims and to traditional Christians and to Jews. It's difficult. It wasn't easy for the disciples in the first century. Difficult is always there. <laughs> you're going to see it. You're going to suffer it. But God will always give you fruit. God will always give you souls that you will rejoice when you see them coming from darkness to light. Rise and shine, Isaiah said in Isaiah 60. For your light have come. Hallelujah. Today I want to take this sentence and challenge you with it. I want to tell you, rise and shine. Don't let those burdens, those challenges in your life prevent you from rejoicing and celebrating the salvation, the presence of God in your life. Wherever the, lights, the light shines, everything will be exposed. Come today and let's expose our hearts before him. Whatever stands between, and, between you and him, I want to give you a moment of silence. I will be quiet too for maybe half a minute. I just want you to pause and think of anything that can stand between you and God and let it go now, okay? Thank you, Holy Spirit, for shining in our hearts. Thank you for leading our lives. Thank you for comforting our hearts. Lord, I pray this moment, Holy Spirit of God, that you'll search our hearts. And you'll consume with your fire all those things that might Stand between me and my Lord. Purify me, Lord. Purify my mind, my heart, even my body and my soul. I thank you, Lord God, for shining with your salvation through Jesus, my Lord, in my life. I pray, Lord, for everyone who have come today to this place that you'll speak to his heart. Speak to my brothers and sisters to start carrying in their hearts those sinners around them, praying for them. For Lord, we know that the prayer of the righteous brings forth fruits and answers. Lord Jesus, we pray. Help us to continue serving, to continue standing, 
and to be there, out there in this world, as salt, as light. Thank you for driving us out of darkness to your light. Make our lives as light for the world. Help us to stand. Help us to witness. For we ask it and seek it in Jesus' mighty name. To him we give all glory and honor forevermore. Amen.